Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello and welcome to today's Australian Water School webinar titled Fitting the Curve. Now, today we've got um, the privilege of having some software developers uh, with us, some statisticians um, and hydrologists. Um, this is something we want to uh, take statistics today and relate it to the water world. Um, this is the water school after all, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we give you the best tools and bring you the best content that we possibly can. So welcome to all of you from around the world. Um, this has been a tremendous response to this, almost a thousand registrants uh, for today's webinar um, from over 50 or 60 countries. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, we hope you gain something from this webinar today and that we can provide you resources that help you in your career. With that, let me um, introduce to you our presenters for today. So if you all can turn on your cameras, um, Hayden, Mike, uh, Beth, uh, we'd love to just uh, find out a little bit uh, more about you, um, where you're coming to us from, and um, have a bit of a response to the poll question. So thanks to all the attendees who filled out the poll question in the beginning. We wanted to get a feel for um, what concepts are you familiar with and which ones um, uh, might be brand new to you, um, just so we can help steer uh, the content for today and the level <laughs> of uh, the conversation that's going to go on. So in that order, and as we see it on the screen, um, let's have you all introduce yourselves. Um, Hayden, tell us a little bit about your background, um, how you got to be uh, in this uh, nerdy subject of uh, statistics, and uh, wh wh where you're coming to us from uh, today. Over to you, Hayden. Yep. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Hayden Smith. I'm with the Army Board of Engineers Risk Management Center. Uh, my background, uh, bachelor's degrees in civil engineering, and I have a master's in, in risk management and economics uh, with focuses in both on statistics. Um, I've been working with the Risk Management Center for about a decade and doing software development about the same time frame. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's about it. All yeah. right. Uh, over <laughs> to you, Mike. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Bartles. I work for the Hydrologic Engineering Center within the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So I'm the HEC SSP team lead. I did a stint as the HEC HMS team lead as well, but I got off the hook for that and handed that over somebody else for a little bit but thanks for having me here i appreciate the opportunity yes um, mike's a frequent flyer here um, with the water school having presented uh, lots uh, of content about hms uh, for us in the past so we're excited to hear from him yeah. today about ssp and how that ties in now for her debut today on the australian water school's uh, youtube channel and on our webinars uh beth um, let's have you introduce yourself um beth um, has agreed to join us today um, to answer the questions in the background and we'll be referring you to lots of content that um, she's put online um, where you can get uh, a lot more familiar and get to know her a little better um, through some of her technical expertise. Um, so Beth, uh, let's have an introduction from you. Hi, I'm Beth Faber. I work with Mike at the Hydrologic Engineering Center. I'm here in Davis, California. Uh, let's see, I've been here in California about 22 years. Um, for that, I did my undergraduate uh, and master's degree at the University of Colorado and my doctorate at um, Cornell University. Um, I don't know how I ended up in this uh, subject of stochastic hydrology. I think it's because of who I studied with in grad school, even though I didn't do it then, but I, I somehow ended up in it now. <laughs> yeah, um, I was having this, class, this the subjects in school, I was it was it seemed the most boring thing. But the more I uh, get farther down in my career, uh, the more fascinating I find uh, this topic. Um, and we can go down many, many rabbit holes, as you'll see today. We'll probably have to stop ourselves every once in a while and say, "Okay, for more information, click on this," because um, we have the you know the 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 risk of potentially just starting to ramble off on things that just go straight over everybody's head because there are some uh, terms that are uh, a little difficult to um, uh, to visualize and conceptualize. So let's have a look at the poll questions real quick um, with our panelists on um, before we get into the presentations. And just uh, let me know if you see any surprises there. Commercial and consulting um, generally comes out on top, so there's no surprise there. Um, Mike, during his presentation, will uh, talk a little bit about which is older, unless you wanted to hit that now, Mike. Do you want to hit that during your presentation or do you want to talk about it now for sure i'm pumped that so many people knew this but bravo yeah All so right. hec was founded in 64 bulletin 15 was released that was the first like thou shalt do this federal flood frequency guidance within the united states in 67 
And then the first personal computer was like the mid 70s. So <laughs> outdates all, right. all of them. Puts, puts things into perspective. And sometimes we put the question up there, which is older, Australia, the United States, or the Corps of Engineers? And we find out that the Corps of Engineers itself actually predates the, uh, um, you know, our Independence Day festivities there. So um, it's actually <laughs> been around for quite a while. So quite a history there. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I wanted to make sure that we're all... Um, uh, familiar with as presenters to to see where everybody's coming uh, from uh, is the distribution in the software. So a few people have used Bulletin 17. This is why we wanted to make sure that Beth, um, we, we introduced Beth and uh, some of her resources because uh, being the Australian Water School, we do get a lot of Australian attendees who may not have uh, heard of it. So we want to make sure you have the resources available to you. Uh, lots of people have used Excel for statistics. Uh, DSS um, gets, gets a few mentions there along with FFA, which was the predecessor, and then SSP. Um, and uh, yeah, only 7% of the attendees has ever used Best Fit. So Hayden, let's change that statistic today. Um, um, you do see a lot um, that have used Flyke, and we will give you resources today for those who want to get a deeper dive into Flyke. Um, got a couple of comments that we've incorporated from George Casera, and um, uh, who's helped to develop that software. And we want to make sure that you're able to get into the guts of that. So there are quite a few users who have used Flyke. Um, uh, Hayden, any uh, any comments on uh, <laughs> the proportion of people who have used Best Fit? Are you surprised by that? Uh, no, not really. It's pretty new, and we don't. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the Risk Management Center it has their own software versus HEC, so um, we don't get uh, trafficked as much on our website. Okay, but it's uh, it is good to see that some people are aware of it. Yeah, good. <laughs> and these terms, then you see at the last question, these terms are some of the things that sometimes get me um, uh, get, get me a little nervous when I start hearing some of these terms that I heard in uh, grad school or something um, uh, where I may not have been prepared for a exam as well as I should have been. Uh, but you'll notice here, no shame in it. Um, only 25% of the people have even uh, are able to define the term Bayesian. And so that's all over the documentation. So this is just for our presenters to make sure we uh, understand where everybody's coming to us from. Almost everybody knows how to define a, or what defines a normal distribution and some of these other standard terms like skewness and standard deviations. Um, but yeah, some of these other things like the Gumbel, <laughs> the Wable, um, these are things that uh, we may want to provide you some additional resources on. Um, Beth, any uh, any surprises from you on, uh, uh, on those results? Um, a little bit. I'm surprised how many people already knew what a PILF is. But I guess those okay. are the ones who've read Bulletin 17C. Well, there we go. Okay, well, we'll provide you with um, some additional resources here. Um, in the meantime, so what we'll do, um, all of our presenters um, will be answering your Q&A questions in the background. Um, so we'll, I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen and show you a couple of resources here. And then we'll go through and have Hayden and then Mike um, give us a demo of some of this software and some of the uh, frequent questions that, uh, that come up. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you just a five to 10 minute overview. Um, this is something we covered in a course um, just a few months ago uh, on uh, stochastic hydrology. And it's really just uh, to, to try and get um, anybody who is new to some of these terms to kind of catch up um, and able to keep up with some of the things that might get presented later on. So there's a Twitter feed a while back um, where somebody talked about the inevitability of nuclear war. Now, I, I grew up in the, uh, you know, the 70s and 80s where it was always discussed, um, something that always seemed uh, like it might be coming. Maybe that chance has gone down. Maybe it's gone up. What is it? Is it 1%? Well, if the chance of a nuclear war in any given year was 1%, how long do you have to go before it essentially becomes inevitable? And this may uh, sound a little bit scary, but we need to get into some of the uh, concepts called uh, Euler's number. And to get it way back um, in hydrologic terms, if we take it to a coin toss, just a 50-50 coin toss, um, let's make this either a wet year or a dry year. If we take a median uh, median rainfall, median flow, um, if you took a median value and you go to any given year if it's random or dry the next year. So you're either going to have a below median year if you're looking at um, annual maxima or an above uh, median year. So that's a 50-50 chance. So if you toss a coin 50-50, you have a couple of different um, options. And the this number down here is the one I want to make sure that um, we, we have an understanding of. Um, you only have um, you know certain paths. Once you go down one path, you can't go back to the other. So you have these bins at the bottom. You've If you roll it twice, have a 50-50 chance, you can either get heads twice, heads or tails, tails or heads, or tails and tails. So the chance that you'll get a heads at least once is three out of four, and the chance that you get a tails at least once will be 
three out of four. So that's a 75%. Now those bins very quickly um, can, uh, you know, get get astronomically large, um, the number of bins. Now, this is just one half of a heads or tails roll. And as you get down and roll it a few times, um, you'll get all these different bins. And uh, we've got frequencies associated with this. But once you get down to 5, 10, 15, 20 uh, of these rolls, you very quickly get to the number of atoms in the universe. And this is one of the reasons why you'll never run out of these QR codes. Um, if you had this binary progression, and it's either on or off, as you come across here, um, you're going to very quickly have, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of combinations um, that are options. So let's look at something with three instead of two, and that's rock, paper, scissors. So if we are looking at the chance of um, having rock at least once, um, you know, once or or more, um, once you get down here and roll a um, uh, or do uh, put your put your rock paper scissors out there three times um, with a one in three chance, we get to this 19 to 27 ratio, where you know, all of these have a rock in them, these have a rock in them, these have a rock in them, those, those, and these. So that's where we get the 19 out of 27 for three out of three. Now let's do a die, six out of six. If we roll the die six times and a one in six chance, well, now we're starting to approach this very special number here, um, which tells us about the inevitability of uh, nuclear war or um, the 100 year event coming around, um, if I can use that term still. Now let's take that to a 100 sided die. If we roll a 100 sided die 100 times, that's where we start to get into our um, statistics where we can relate this to water. Now, I've got a few things here um, that I'll provide some links to um, on the background resources. Um, if you remember back in the days of Price is Right, um, the, uh, that's uh, what I grew up uh, seeing sometimes, there's this Plinko game, and you start to fill up these bins. Now, in a Plinko game, you can go one way and you can go the other way, and you'll start to come back toward the middle, and you can skew this one way or another. Um, you can, um, I'll give you these links to some of these things that you can play online, and um, get a feel for some of the distributions and the skews. I've also got a spreadsheet um, that I'll give you a link to, um, which I'll show you here. Um, if you, um, if we hit uh, just in, in Excel and we hit uh, F9 over and over and over again, and we're rolling heads or tails, how many times would I have to roll to get heads five times in a row? You know, if I had, if I kept hitting this over and over at some point, I probably have a chance of getting that. But let's look at the Plinko game here. And if I hit this one over and over and over again, um, how many times before I get a heads 10 times in a row? Um, how about 100 times in a row? And I'm doing sets of 10 rolls here to see if I can ever get up here, you know, in this sideways Plinko game. Um, and in the end, it doesn't take many rolls at all to get to the number of atoms in the universe. Um, if somebody tells you they flipped a coin, a hundred times and got heads a hundred times in a row, I'm going to say, sorry, I don't believe you, or it's rigged. Um, that's just not possible. Um, you, you know, in any reasonable sense, you're going to run into um, some uh, challenges there. So um, back to this uh, sheet here on the, uh, if we, if we were to roll over and over again, um, a hundred times in a row for a one in a hundred sided die, we get to this magic number here. Um, which is going to involve Euler's number. Um, it's this 63% probability that um, if you, uh, again, wait 100 years, what are the chances that you will have at least one, uh, one in 100 AEP event? Now, what I wanted to focus on here is the inevitability. This is the scary part about the nuclear war bit. Um, if you go 500 years um, and wait for this one in 100 AEP, uh, to occur, you're up at a 99% probability. So let's hope nuclear war is less probable than that. So I'm not going to cover any of these. This is um, some of the background behind, um, this is straight out of the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Manual. This is what's going on in the background. It's a little intimidating to look at. I like to see these things graphically, and I hope today then we can take some of these concepts that might look a little strange or um, intimidating and kind of turn them into these uh, visual concepts that will help out. And um, last thing I'll cover here then is um, the a couple of concepts that if you don't understand these, um, go back and um, review these. Um, we need to know a little bit about logarithms for this, and we need to know a little bit about Euler's number. And um, when we're doing these things, um, I think we've got, uh, let me just uh, move this out of the way here and um, show you a couple of resources that we'll have, and then Hayden's going to share his screen. Um, Hayden, if you want to get ready to start sharing your screen, this is the last thing that I wanted to share with you today, um, was uh, these resources that we posted. I've put this at surfacewater.biz slash FFA. And um, on this website, we've got links to all the software that we're going to be discussing today. Um, we've got uh, links to some courses 
uh, where you can uh, review just stochastic hydrology going all the way back to the basics like we just did and then fill in the gaps to what um, our presenter is going to be talking about today. We've got a flight course for those in Australia um, on FFA in, uh, in Australia. And then we've got webinar links um, and these will make more sense after you've seen our presenters talk today where they may be referring to um, additional resources. So with that, um, I just wanted to give you a basic overview back to flipping a coin on some of the statistics that we'll be talking about. And now we'll uh, turn it over to Hayden, if you want to start sharing your screen and let's get an overview of this best fit software. And here, I do want to start by just saying that, you know, we kind of stand on the shoulder of giants and George Kazera from Australia uh, contributed significantly to the advancement of Bayesian flood frequency methods uh, in the world. And best fit was, you know, is able to replicate flight software. That's George Kazera's software uh, that's used uh, in, in Australia predominantly. Um, it's kind of a new take on flight with some new cool features, um, but it's been validated against flight and you should be able to get the same answers out of it. I just wanted to mention that up front. All right. Um, I'm going to give a, a real brief background into the origins of Best Fit. Um, you know what it is why we use it and when when to use it uh i'm gonna go into the input data a little bit of distribution fitting um and then go into the actual software with a demo after that and then i'm gonna uh, wrap it up with a, a quick example for non-stationary flood frequency um, dealing with climate change or land use change okay quick quick introduction to the background so this software came about because in the dam and levee safety programs in the core we we were continuing to see cases where we couldn't reconcile different types of flood data. So maybe we had at site flow data, we had rainfall runoff data, we had paleo flood data. We were struggling to combine those in a meaningful way. Uh, they were all given different answers and they would all lead to different design decisions. So we developed this uh, specifically to help us in the flood risk management planning, dam and levee safety communities. The Bayesian approach is able to incorporate all of that hydrologic information, paleo floods, regional rainfall runoff results, expert elicitation in a coherent, meaningful way. And because it can combine all that, it provides higher confidence in the fitted flood frequency curves, especially at extreme floods that we care about for things like dam and levee safety. Uh, I just want to make note that uh, the software was developed by the RMC, but also in collaboration with our uh, Engineering Research and Development Center, ERDIC. So what is Bayes? There are not that many people had a, a deep understanding of Bayes theorem. It's that little nasty equation at the top there. It's the only equation I'm going to show in the slides, or maybe maybe there's a couple others, but um, it's not super important that you, you're able to, to grasp that guy. The main thing is the diagram here. So Bayes takes prior information on the left, combines that with at-site observations, and, and plugs that into a model likelihood function and then it spits out a posterior distribution. So it's able to take prior data, at site data, boom, spits out your best estimate in the posterior. That's the main thing to know about it. The, the most significant aspect of Bayes versus historical or more classical fitting methods is this prior knowledge component. So we're with through prior knowledge, we can bring in regional spatial information, we can bring in expert elicitation, and we can bring in rainfall runoff type results. Okay, so when to use it? We use it across the board for semi-quantitative and quantitative uh, risk and hazard assessments and higher levels of studies in the core, um, but it's most valuable when you have multiple sources of data where you can really bring to bear that prior knowledge. Um, when there's just at-site data, it's not as important to use Bayes, but when you have other data, Bayes is really gonna give you the better answer. Okay, so um, I'm going to briefly discuss the input data and what goes into that. This follows uh, the terminology used widely in the U.S. and Bulletin 17C, uh, which has been mentioned quite a bit of times already. Um, we, we label data into kind of three categories. We have systematic data, interval data, and threshold data. So systematic data is collected at a regular prescribed interval, um, and it's assumed to have no measurement error at least in version one, in, the, in a future version, we'll be able to account for measurement error as well. 
Um, and from here, you can run hypothesis testing, low outlier tests, et cetera, uh, off of this data set. So this is like your at site gauge data that you would pull in from USGS in the States. Interval data uh, bounds the data between a lower and upper bound, and it's particularly useful for historical type information. So maybe we have some newspaper reports from the 1800s when settlers first came about, uh, or we have some paleo flood information that has some level of you know, model uncertainty that we want to incorporate. Uh, those are the typical common use cases. And those are shown as those vertical error bars there. And then finally, threshold data. Uh, for the for version one, we just do left sensor data. And so what that means, um, a perception threshold, is that in that pink box that you're seeing on the screen, is what we're saying is that during that time period from you know 1820 to 1880, had a flood occurred, it would have been less than you know 38,000 CFS. So all we can say is that we know that um, when a flood occurred, it wasn't bigger than some value. We know it was less than some value. And that's really useful for um, extending the record because you know we might not have exact data points uh, from a newspaper or from paleo floods, but we know something hasn't ever been exceeded. And so that's where this uh, perception threshold is very valuable. Okay, the next thing you can do in best fit is distribution fitting, just basic fitting. This is with maximum likelihood. Uh, it's a type. It's you know it's similar to Bayes, but there's no prior knowledge. Um, the main thing is model selection. So there's 13 probability distributions in best fit that you can choose from. And there's three goodness of fit measures, AIC, BIC, and root mean squared error that are provided. The main thing to know about this is that the smaller the value, the better. So the smaller the AIC, BIC, and root mean squared error, the better the model. Uh, beyond statistical measures, we can just look at graphical plots. So there's uh, frequency plots, PDF plots, CDF, uh, percentile, percentile, and quantile, quantile. And we can see that given this data set and a possibility of 13 distributions, the fit ranges all over the place. So we really need a, you know, a good measure such as AIC, BIC to lead us towards a, a, a superior distribution. Um, and then just this is just a, a note that out of all those distributions, you can get full summary statistics to, you know, you can take this plug it into Excel, do whatever you want to with it to do your own analysis. All right, so we've input our data, we've selected a model, say it's GEV or log Pearson type three. Now we wanna run a, a Bayesian analysis. So you just create a new analysis, select your data, select your distribution, hit go. Boom, you're gonna get, get, get a flood frequency curve with uncertainty bounds, like as shown on the, the screen there. And from there, we can start, you know, diagnosing the simulation. I, I didn't mention this earlier. I didn't want to get too in the weeds, but uh, BestFit uses something called Bayesian Markov Chain Monte Carlo to, to do estimation. It's not super important for the purposes of this presentation. There'll be more resources that can go into to greater detail. But MCMC uh, can be assessed for convergence. And so there's, uh, for the, the power users out there, the pros that maybe have had some graduate courses, you can go inspect autocorrelation plots. You can look at the chain traces to, to make sure that they're stable. Um, and then you can also go and explore your actual uh, parameter results. So here we can look at prior distributions versus posterior distributions on say skew of log Pearson type three or mean, et cetera. And you can also see how those parameters interact with each other. So in this case, this is a log Pearson type three. We can see how the standard deviation parameter interacts with the skew parameter. All right, so I'm gonna uh, step into a demo real quick and let me pull this up. So when you open Best Fit, you're just gonna have a, a screen here. You got a project explorer on the left, properties window on the right and the message window. To create an analysis, it's as simple as this. We, we create a new data set and you know you might, I have values from HEC DSS, or it can be from any number of sources. It can be in a text file, spreadsheet, whatever. Um, and all we got to do is grab that, copy it, and we're going to add a row and, and then, um, sorry, one second, uh, and then paste it in there. 
voila. So that's our uh, input data. And we can look at a chronology plot here that, that sorts it in order in terms of date. And we can look at the empirical uh, plotting positions of that. Next, we can create a new analysis. So all we have to do is grab our input data. And in this case, the default distribution is the generalized extreme value, GEV, which is widely used globally. And then just hit play. And it's going to run, take a few seconds. And then now we have our uh, best fit distribution with uncertainty bounds. And we can go in and explore our parameters, as I showed in the slides, uh, how they interact. And you know we can go look at convergence and the, the likelihood and traces, et cetera. So one thing that has come up in, in recent times is, you know, there's this huge floods that have occurred out of nowhere. And, you know, are they really the, you know, is a 500 year event or is it really a hundred year event? How do we know? So this, the data I'm using here is actually from a paper by Viglione out of um, Italy, um, famous paper on Bayesian flood frequency. And in, he show, he demos in this example, uh, there's a, in 2002, there's this huge flood event that occurred. So I'm gonna create a new analysis. I'm gonna plop that in. And it's, it's way up here, if y'all can see it on the screen. So it's considerably bigger than every other data point. So what does that do to our fit? We can quickly create a new analysis, grab that data, run it. And we can toggle back and forth and we can see it you know pretty significantly changes our fit in terms of the tails you know if we're trying to design something to a thousand year or to a specific uh, flow level our our risk is going to change pretty dramatically with that one event so can we do better can we put that one event into context and that's really where the power of Bayes comes in so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to a, a formal analysis here where um, they bring that data into context so. We have that huge event in 2002 that's up here. We have some historical data uh, from the 1600s and 1800s we brought in as flood intervals, and we have a perception threshold over that whole time. So nothing uh, during that time except for these three events ever exceeded 300 uh, cubic meters per second. And then uh, we can run that fit. And we see that, you know, that significantly reduced our confidence intervals. Now we're fitting through the data. We fit through that 2002 point really well, kind of brings that data point into context. We can go even further, though, with Bayes, and we can um, add causal information. So this is rainfall runoff results. So in this case, the rainfall runoff model was run and at the 500 year event, um, this is shown on the screen on the right as 0.000 or 0 0.002 uh, annual exceedance probability. And they select a prior based off of rainfall runoff results and expert elicitation that we expect a 500 year event to have a mean of 480 and a standard deviation of 80. And now that we've selected that, we see how that uh, plots with our data. And then we can run that rather quickly and see what those results look like. And now, we brought in time temporal expansion back through the 1600s. We brought in causal expansion with rainfall runoff results. And now we have a true best estimate fit that brings to bear all available data. So that's really the advantage of a Bayesian analysis. Okay, um, I'm gonna come back to my slides because I think we're running low on time. And I just wanna uh, just reiterate a few of those key points. So the Bayesian flood frequency approach can incorporate all available sources of data. That's its main advantage. Because of this, it has, you know, it can provide significantly better estimates for extreme flood frequencies and really bring those big flood events into context. And, you know, in, in the core anyways, for dam and levee safety, we're complementing systematic data with that temporal spatial causal expansion as a standard procedure now for all of our studies. We go do regional analysis, we do rainfall runoff analysis, we go do paleos as, as often as we can to really bring those big events into context to give us our best possible answer. So next things on the horizon, version two of the software, we're gonna have a time series data analysis option with hypothesis testing. So right now you can just you know paste in block maxima 
but you'll also be able to, to you know, bring in your full time series, compute block maxima or compute peaks over threshold, and then run tests for uh, independence and homogeneity and trends. I'm going to add a couple more distributions. We're going to bring in measurement error, uh, non-stationary flood frequency analysis to deal with climate change, some mixture models for you know different flood driving mechanisms, model averaging. We saw that distribution fitting where we had you know 13 curves. It could be anywhere out there. Now we can model or we can average over all of those models, and then we're going to do some joint distribution options in there as well. So a whole bunch more coming in version two. I just really want to quickly do a snapshot on what a non-stationary flood frequency analysis might look like. So in this case, we, we model the parameters of a distribution as being variable with time. In Texas, um, down in around Houston, there's significant urbanization. Hurricane Harvey hit here in 2017. This is our biggest tropical storm in terms of rainfall depth that we've seen in the states. And we can see from this gauge that there's a clear upward trend in the data over time. So when we fit an LP3 with a time varying mean parameter, this is our two year uh, return period. So we can see that the two year return period no longer is just some fixed point. It varies with time and it's, con and it's increasing over time in this particular site. Likewise, here's the 100 year flow and it, it's varying with time. And then finally, when we, when we want to look at a frequency curve, it's, it's kind of difficult to do that with non-stationarity. So what you need to do is you have to pick a time step. So in this case, I picked the most re recent time step, 2021, and that's the shaded bounds there versus the red curve, which is our stationary fit. So we can see there's a significant difference between these two fits. And if we're designing to say a thousand year or to you know say a hundred thousand CFS, you're going to end up with completely different design. So it, it, this goes to show you that the ability to incorporate non-stationarity has a potential to significantly change our you know, future engineering designs and structures. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it back to you. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, Mike, uh, while you're sharing your screen, uh, Beth, if you're able to come on, um, I want to make sure we get some of your input um, here. Maybe just uh, if you could just reference that um, that question that you answered, um, MCMC, Mac Mac, <laughs> um, uh, just uh, and, and maybe um, mention the references that you've provided since uh, those watching the recording won't see your responses there. And then um, one, one question that I had for you then is, um, you know, I know I've, I've linked to your um, Bulletin 17 uh, webinar. What would those who um, are uh, watching, you know, and, and can, you know, can just open up the software and just use it, um, what would they gain from going back and reading bulletins? So those two questions for you. <laughs> While Mike's uh, getting ready to share his screen, Mike, you can go ahead and start sharing already. Okay, uh, the, the reference that I provided for Bayesian MCMC with um, in frequency analysis is, um, just uh, one of many that are on that topic, but that one happened to include my um, thesis advisor as an author. So I, I had it uh, a little bit more to hand. Um, it, it's a good paper. There's a lot of others out there as well. Um, what's the benefit of reading the bulletins uh, if you can just do the analysis with software? Uh, as, as someone of the generation that you claim to be, um, <laughs> I don't like... I don't like sending folks to do software to do anything that they couldn't have done by hand, or at least understand exactly what the software is doing for them to um, make it a little easier than having to go back and do it by hand. So um, I think that there's always value in going back and reading the documents and really seeing what's behind a lot of the assumptions and checking whether assumptions are true and understanding choices that might have been made and whether or not they apply in the situation always good to, to gain a better understanding, I think. Excellent. No, I, I definitely, definitely agree on that. Um, and um, I think we, one of our presenters, um, uh, Mark Babister from the, uh, in our recent FFA course um, for Australian rainfall and runoff uh, mentioned that you can just code the whole thing up in R. Um, but he even mentioned that uh, some of this stuff, um, you know, he said, even for the authors, they look at the chapter in Australian rainfall and runoff about flood frequency. And they said, it's, it's really heavy. And, and, and it, it's really, um, it, it gets into terms very quickly that seem overwhelming. So we want to make sure that we've kind of filled that gap in here. Um, so thanks for that, uh, Beth. We'll keep uh, our presenters and panelists uh, answering the questions in the background on the chat line. Uh, Mike, if you don't want to just um, hit your full screen um, for uh, mm -hmm. the presentation mode, um, I can see that just fine. And let's hear about SSP. 
yeah, props to everybody that's asking the questions. You guys are heavy hitters. Holy moly. Um, a lot of very, very knowledgeable folks in the crowd. I uh, am impressed by the level of the interest and questions that people are asking about. Bravo. I am a practicing engineer. I'm just a visitor in this world. I uh, did not have a significant amount of theoretical or university experience in statistical hydrology before joining the Corps of Engineers. So it was kind of baptism by fire. So I consider myself more of like a, a layman in these terms and more of an applications guy, right? I know when something is weird and smells wrong, right? Doesn't look quite right. Um, I don't know all of the math behind the scenes. It's been a really long time since I did a double integral, but um, I apply more of a, a tilt of like, I'm going to use this for an actual application and make a decision on here and I better be understanding what's going on with this. So I want to bring up a couple of topics today really, really quickly and build upon what Hayden presented, which is all great stuff. I'm going to build upon what Hayden presented and leave you with a couple of things to think about um, and possibly get into a, a bit of discussion. So I'd be remiss without bringing up a couple of things for HEC SSP. Um, Latest release that's coming up is version 2.3. You can grab our latest beta from our website. I get links to downloads there and the training materials that we go along. We spend a lot of time developing training materials. So we have tons of videos, tons of class materials, tons of tutorials and guides that are on there as well. So definitely give those, give those a shot. But one thing that I want you guys to think about, um, and this plagues us as well, right, is what to do when we have a massive, huge flood event as has recently happened in Australia, right? Hayden talked about Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Um, we don't have to go very far back in time to find examples of things happening that we never really considered to be possible within the realm of like a human lifetime or experience like that. A really good example being um, the 1955 flood event in the Northeastern United States. So this is um, an analysis from from HEC SSP that allows you to compute a moving time window, either moving or expanding, right? So in this example, I start with 20 years of data starting in, I think the 1928 is where this, this event or this analysis starts. And I go out to 1948, right? I include 20 years of data, I compute and fit a log Pearson three distribution to that. Then I increase by five years and I fit another distribution to it. Then I increase by five years. You can control the windows there, but you can quickly see how these parameters change. Um, relatively quickly, right? Mean standard deviation and skew, they bounce all over the place. Skew bounces a lot, right? That's the most uncertain parameter out of the three that are used to, to parameterize the log Pearson three distribution. That changes a lot. Beth is the master of showing these examples um, from a hypothetical standpoint too. So if you're interested in that, she's got tons of that. But you can see how that plays out in terms of quantiles, right? So the one in 500 flow I show on the right, that's in blue. The one in 100 AEP flow shown in green and the one in 10 AEP flow shown in uh, orange on the right, right? So when I start to look at the 1955 flood event, these things change a whole lot. Um, be prepared to see changes when you start to incorporate huge flood events, right? And when do we wanna do flow frequency analyses and update flow, flow frequency analyses? It's right after these large events occur, right? We are a reactive society. We don't necessarily proactively go out and build a whole ton, whole bunch of things. We go and build infrastructure or change things after flood events have occurred. So keep that in mind. Um, hopefully this tool here allows you guys to, to visualize how these things change over time and also use them as, as teaching tools, right? I wish I had this stuff for public meetings that I went to in the past. Hayden hit at uncertainty, um, which is something to always be cognizant of uh, uncertainty in parametric modeling, so fitting a distribution using a fitting method, right? So I can fit the log Pearson three distribution using multiple different fitting methods. Those are each different models. Um, uncertainty in those models arises from a whole bunch of different sources. Um, one of those being model choice, right? How often do we consider that? Your choice of model can have some pretty heavy uh, implications that go along with it. Really great publication. From the USGS, got to give a shout out to Tim Cohn. He was a master in this world. Um, was a major player in Bulletin 17C, which is federal flood frequency guidance within the Corps of Engineers or within the, the United States. Um, he was one of the main authors there. He was a main author in this paper as well. Um, it gets that. What do we do when we start to extrapolate or this paper 
talks about what do we do when we start to extrapolate, right? So here's a screenshot showing a several different analytical distributions fit to the same data set, right? I showed the gamma distribution in here, two parameter gamma. That's the orange curve there. That's kind of junky, doesn't look that great. So that's obviously a bad choice. But the other ones that I show here um, aren't necessarily bad choices at all. They pretty evenly fit the data that I'm showing here, but when I extrapolate to the one in 10,000 AP where we live for dam safety and levy safety studies and things like that, there's a significant amount of uncertainty that goes along with that. Um, be cognizant of the choices that you're making here. At least be cognizant of the choices that you're making when you fit a distribution to data and when you start to extrapolate to the one in 10,000 AP or beyond, right? We need to live in that world for risk informed decision making things. Um, one thing that I would suggest for everybody to do to reduce uncertainty is incorporate as much data as you possibly can. Hayden hit at that for incorporating precipitation frequency results in, um, in your distribution parameterization. Another way that you can do that is to actually incorporate more at site information right from a nearby gauge. Um, if you have a very, very short gauge record, look for nearby long term sites to extend that record. Um, you can now do this within HEC SSP, so you can use record extension techniques like the maintenance of variance extension, um, which is included within Bulletin 17C as well. This is typically what you get out of that, right? We're essentially fitting a linear model to concurrent data in order to estimate what happened or what would have happened, likely happened, at the shorter record site given the concurrent statistics between the two. When you actually include that information, in your at site flow frequency analysis or with in combination with your at site information, you can make a much more informed prediction of what flow frequency looks like and ultimate stage frequency consequences and make better investment decisions here. So this is just an example where I took a very short record site and I extended that by how many years was it? Like I think it was 17 years or something like that. It's not the full 19 years to concurrent record, but it was it was somewhere along those lines. Um, was able to make a much, much better uh, prediction here in terms of extending my record, fitting a better distrib or distribution um, that's better fit, um, and more informed in predictions um, are much, much better there. So giving something for you guys to think about, um, sources of uncertainty are definitely diverse when you're performing a flood frequency analysis. Be cognizant of them, um, but don't shy away from it. We can't just start with a blank sheet of paper and not do anything. We have to do something. So attempt to incorporate as much data as you possibly can to reduce that uncertainty. Um, there's a whole bunch of new tools out there for you guys to visualize your data um, and perform better uh, analysis as well. All right, that's all I got. I'm gonna spur discussion um, and see what questions come up. We can go through the chat if you guys are ready to do that. Yeah, um, Beth, if you're still with us, um, if you can, uh, I wanted to have you just highlight, um, you know, just so select one of the questions that you've answered. There are so many, um, as Mike mentioned, um, maybe just choose one to um, focus on and then we'll just kind of make the rounds um, and take turns um, having everybody pick uh, pick a question that's coming on the Q&A line to address. So uh, yeah, the, it seems like there's a lot of interest in the climate change non-stationarity um, in the in the chat so and additionally multi-site analysis so it seems like a, several folks are interested in in a, in a regional version or multi-site version so best fit version one and two are just single site analyses but if there's a large demand um then you know we could easily add a a multi-site regional analysis option in a version three of the software um the um other comment is the non-stationarity how best to handle that so Version two, I'm just going to, to add the ability to model the parameters as trends over time. And so best practices would be, you know, we want to assess our data, you know, do, run some hypothesis tests to, to actually see if there's detectable trends. So we need, to, we need to run some statistical tests on the data. Then we need to do model selection. So we need to run our stationary, our classic analysis. Then we need to run our various trend options and then compare which is a better model. And we can use AIC and BIC uh, as as means to to do that. So if the stationary analysis is giving you better AIC, then that's telling you that even though there's a trend, it's not significant enough to to model those trends. But if, like the example I showed, there's a significant trend, 
then we should model it and we can do better with the non-stationary analysis. So great questions, uh, lots of ongoing research on that. And uh, it seems like there's a lot of interest from the field in that aspect. No, I think so. Um, now, you know, one of the things we wanted to show you with this webinar is how easy it can be. Um, you know, uh, best fit is something where you can just open it up. I was surprised when I first heard about it, I opened the link, I popped in some data and like in two minutes, I was looking at my curves and compared to having to learn DSS and other um, approaches for some of the other software or get into the flight, um, uh, so some of the, the parameterization there, um, it, it, it is very easy to use, but that can be dangerous. Um, when we did our course in uh, the Australian Rainfall and Runoff course, um, where we stepped through with Flyke um, some of the examples, um, so you've got those links if you wanted to uh, do a deeper dive there. The first example, um, everybody was given a set of data and said, here, do the um, do the flood frequency, and it was wrong, intentionally wrong. It's just, <laughs> you know, you have to watch out. You can't just take the data, plug it in, and start uh, spouting off numbers to the press and say, this was a you know, this was a one in 2000 event. Um, <laughs> Mike, I know we talked a little bit. Um, one of the questions that has come up um, frequently, and I see a couple of these references on the chat line. Um, when we are looking at, and I, we mentioned this briefly, and I know it's a rabbit hole, but um, uh, maybe just just uh, give us the, the, the brief overview and maybe some point to additional resources. When we are looking at a given event, like uh, happened in Australia uh, just recently, there were several events that, were well above the historical and they happened in some cases weeks apart in some cases of a couple of months apart but some of those won't get counted because they're not part of the annual maximum only the maximum is going to get counted um why do we ignore and what is the risk in ignoring and what are the alternatives to ignoring the second third and fourth storm in a given year which may exceed all previous records for sure it was a good very very good question and one that comes up quite frequently um Historically, annual maximum series, or just choosing the largest flood event in a given year. So that can be like in the US, the standard water year is October 1st through September 30th, which just so happens to coincidentally fall along the federal fiscal year. Hmm. Um, and not necessarily hydrologic speaking. Uh, anyways, we've choose the, the largest flood event within there and use that in our analyses as a shortcut to try and ensure independence of flood events, right? We don't wanna choose a flood event that's only as big as it was or its magnitude that was measured is only as big as it was because some other flood event happened right before that one happened. That is a very difficult thing to ensure when using multiple flood events in a given year. It's even difficult to ensure within an annual maximum series when you have a whole bunch of different flood runoff mechanisms throughout the year like you can in the Northeast. But I feel you on that one. Partial duration series are very, very good things and we want to promote their use more and more. Um, there are some tools within SSP to get at that, but we're making some major strides in the near future with the USGS that manages our gauging programs in the United States to not only promote their use, but also give that data out um, to more and more people. Some of that stuff is available behind the scenes. Um, I'm not sure about gauging programs in other countries, but um, there's a lot of data that's in paper format that have never really been published. It would be really great to have multiple flood events um, in any given year from which I can pull to ensure independence and also ensure that they're identically distributed as well when I do fit a, an analytical distribution to that. So yeah. no, I feel you on that one. We want to do more with that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a topic that came up. Um, you know, we had over 2,000 people register for our um, extreme event um, in Australia webinar just a couple of months ago. There's a lot of interest in trying to figure out, were we just wrong or was this really as extreme as we say? Uh, Mike, um, just so people, I mean, we'd love to see we your were beautiful wrong, faces. By, <laughs> yeah, that, that's by the way, true. I would just all answer you on that one. We're, <laughs> yes. All models are wrong, right? Oh, that's, that's true. But some are better than others and we're really just trying to approximate the real world with only, and sometimes, you know, like 20 years worth of information. So... Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, right now people can see our, be you know, your beautiful faces, nice and large. Um, let's, uh, could you share that one screen just, um, that, that'll shrink us down a little bit on the side that, that one slide where you had the progressive, um, uh, frequency yeah. assessment. Um, I think that'll lead to a couple of good discussions about these recent events and then, um, we'll, we'll, we'll address sure. a couple of the other questions. So if you pull that back up again, um, this is, this is, you know, for example, um, 
in Australia. So that 1955 event that you see there, let's imagine the historical record in Lismore or some places in, uh, you know, in, in uh, the, the Eastern Australia where they had these massive events. And let's imagine that big dot up there um, being this recent event here in 2022. Um, we don't know what's coming. We have no crystal ball. So with that dot there, you know, should we, this was the question that I put out there on our, our LinkedIn posts and other um, social media posts, the question that I put out there, it, it, does it make sense? Should we just immediately redo our flood frequency and risk that short term jump when in all likelihood it's going to uh, come come back down? So Mike, any uh, discussion on that? And then we'll turn it back over to Hayden for some of the many questions that Hayden's been answering in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Um... The short answer, yes, you should 100% always include that information. However, I would strongly recommend that you go and try and find additional information, usually regional, sometimes paleo floods, stuff like that, to try and put that event into a longer historical context. Is that truly the largest event in 50 years? Or is it more representative of, say, the largest flood event or the largest flood that you could have seen within 500 years? Um, that is... The key question in this case, don't don't just look at this and be like, oh, man, I can't incorporate that. Please incorporate all information that you possibly can. This stuff is golden. That's what we care about the most. But try your hardest to collect regional information and place that into a longer historical context if you can. Yeah, no, perfect. OK, that, again, this is a hot topic at the moment um, and it's going to happen all over the place. And again, we start looking at non stationarity. This is a non stationary world. We make these assumptions. Um, you know, there are some things that are changing over time, sometimes in the upward direction, sometimes in the downward direction. Um, yeah, that's um, I've got a few other questions in my head that I'd love to ask you, but let's go to the upvoted questions and those that um, have already been addressed. Um, Hayden, um, you've you've hit quite a few of these. Um, I'll just let you select uh, the ones that you've uh, already highlighted and just just choose which ones you want to present live here. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, there's one up on top about uh, paleo floods, and I can do a, a quick example of that. I'll share my screen real quick. Sure. So um, in, in this case, we had uh, systematic data. This is in a project in the northwest of the United States. And uh, we went and did a paleo flood analysis. So this this is the chronology plot, and it goes back over 2,000 years. So it, it's pretty hard to, to read, so I'm going to zoom up on it here. And the way paleo flood information is entered, so we have all these black points as our systematic data. And then we have all these intervals that come from historical information from, you know, pre dam that, that were written and documented before they designed the dam and uh, maybe newspaper readings, etc. And then we have this guy that we estimated in 1647 to be a paleo flood event. So uh, we can point you to some resources on what that entails, but the geologists go out into the field and they look for evidence of deposition of, you know, some paleo stage indicator. And we could bring that in as an, as an interval data point. And then all the years in between, we can use perception thresholds. And so based off of the data and uh, modeling and engineering judgment, we can put in thresholds to say that during this time period, uh, all we know th is that the events that occurred were less than some value. So in this block between 16, 15, 1800, we know the values were less than roughly 104,000 CFS. So that's how we bring in the data. And then in terms of the analysis, um, in this case, this is our uh, best fit here. So we've, we've selected our historical information. I'm just going to quickly demo the systematic only so you get a frame of reference for what that looks like. And so we just have the... Uh, systematic only. We got pretty wide uncertainty bounds. If we keep like this hundred thousand as a frame of reference, and maybe I'll just add a uh, an annotation here for it. So we keep that as a, a frame of reference. We see, you know, we got three, four, or five orders of magnitude of potential uncertainty across that horizontal line. So next, we can come in and we can uh, see what that does if we add our paleo data. So give that a quick run. It's got a lot of data to process there. And then we see if we keep that horizontal line as reference. Now we took that from four or five orders of magnitude horizontally down to just a little over one by bringing in that paleo data. So that brings a huge value to the analysis in and of itself. But now 
we see the curve shifted dramatically to the left. So in uh, this other case, we have the same data set, uh, but I wanted to, we did some rainfall runoff analysis. I'm gonna uh, adjust my, I'm just gonna 105, 20,000. Let me just do it over here on the one we were working with. So I'm gonna bring in a, a quantile prior. We're bringing that in. In this case, we did it at a 10,000 year and uh, we did a, a comprehensive rainfall runoff analysis model and it plots out here, uh, way to the right of that paleo data. And then we can hit run on that. And now we can bring to bear all data. So we have regional precip frequency plus rainfall runoff in that quantile prior. We have all the paleo data. We got all that data from the 1800s. And now look, our confidence intervals are dramatically shrunk and we really honed in on the best estimate. So if we're designing to something like a probable maximum flood, we want to know what that return period is. This shows us how to, to, to really bring to bear all information. Awesome. That's great demo. Um, and again, I hope you see the value in this, um, in having a webinar where somebody just opens up the software and runs it. And you can see from scratch, you know, a couple of these examples, just plugging things in, you can get some numbers. I hope you've seen some of the cautionary tales on what to be aware of. A lot of people are highlighting some of those cautions in the chat line and in the Q&A line. We'll try to put those resources online for you. Um, we're about out of time today. Um, we will turn it over to um, our speakers for some closing remarks. Um, but while we do that, let's have a couple of slides up here um, to show you some of the other resources available to you. As we've been talking, I've been popping resources into that um, web page, surfacewater.biz slash FFA. Um, if you go there, you should be able to find um, previous webinars on HEC DS. SS, if you want to use that um, for re your records, um, you can get a, a, a tutorial on that, um, a bunch of extra webinars on extreme events, um, how climate change is affecting that, um, and on these recent events in Australia, how do the flood frequency analyses, how have they been affected by these? Um, and sometimes you're still well within the confidence bounds that we previously had. So as Mike said, we're, <laughs> we're generally wrong, but um, we're you know, we're getting as close as we can and the better data we have and the more gauge data that we get, um, the better our results are going to be. So with that, um, we thank you for all your participation. Let's have Mike and then Hayden give us some final closing remarks uh, as we wrap it up. Mike, you first. Just thanks again for all the, the interest and the, the great questions. I know I listed a couple of those that I answer them live. Um, hit me up with an email. I'll get back to you. In general, uh, I would recommend that you learn as much as you possibly can about all these subjects. Um, don't be like me and not take any uh, legit, honest coursework on it. Hayden's the master on that one. I'm sure he can point you in a good direction on uh, some good book smarts. Learn from that. Excellent. Hayden? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Craig. This was a great opportunity. Uh, really great questions from the field. And you see there's a lot of interest and really sharp folks out there. So appreciate the opportunity and, and uh, you know if there's really some serious follow-up questions that you'd like to explore uh, shoot me an email anytime <laughs> excellent so on behalf of the international community of freeloaders um i still pay my u.s taxes so i can't be considered in that category but uh you know the uh mike and hayden and beth have come on um as volunteers today to get the word out about um, the software, these approaches, the potential pitfalls, the opportunities for using it. So we thank them for their time. Um, do uh, sign up for additional courses. Let us know if you wanna see more of this. We can do a deep dive into any one of these topics. Um, you'll notice online, there are hours and hours and hours of um, training webinars and resources. Um, what would you like to see in some of our Australian Water School uh, free webinars? If you wanna see more of this, um, fill that out in the comments. So thanks again to Mike, uh, Hayden and Beth, and to those uh, in the background um, helping to make this happen from the Australian Water School. We'll see you next time around. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative, and critical advances in water science, technology, and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit theaustralianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.